Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Varun. I'm a software engineer at Pinterest uh, in the infrastructure team. So I'll be talking about uh, HBase at Pinterest. Uh, we, we, bas we started experimenting with HBase as a storage technology uh, starting last year. So I'll just uh, try to talk through that and like touch upon some of the applications that we have for HBase at Pinterest. So yeah, I'll, I'll basically uh, try to touch on three, three main themes. That first is why we chose HBase. And then hopefully that will tie into like where we use it, like where we find it apt as a as a data store. And then I'll talk about how where I'll talk about some of the challenges that we faced and um, how we made it work on AWS and the kind of customizations that we had to do. So this is kind of the storage stack at Pinterest prior to uh, prior to having HBase as one of the storage technologies. We relied on like super reliable well-trusted, well-used, uh, open-source technologies. MySQL is our core data store. It is also our like, identifier generator. Memcache uh, has been our distributed cache system. Uh, we use Redis both as an in-memory store, some, a little bit of persistent, uh, so there's some persistent Redis installations, and then uh, we also use it as a cache. Um, so since all of these technologies basically run single-homed, we do uh, manual sharding of these, and the sharding logic has always been in the app tier. Um, there are like processes for failing over shards, splitting, adding machines, but most of that is currently manual. It's on its way to getting more and more automated. But yeah, this is how, how it looked before we had HBase. So next thing is why, why we chose HBase or like what, what different things does it actually bring to the table. So one of the things is like when you look at on-desk stores, HBase has a much more superior write throughput when you compare it with MySQL. And uh, you would kind of expect that because uh, the storage engine of uh, HBase is just highly targeted towards absorbing a large number of writes versus MySQL, which is more, more optimized for reads. The second thing is that we had a lot of data which actually gets generated out of Hadoop jobs, which include like recommendations and things like that. And since HBase uses uh, HDFS, the Hadoop file system, as its underlying file system, there's some really nice tricks that you can use for like loading that data and like swapping it off, and so on and so forth. So that was another another reason. And then of course there's a distributed operation, this fault tolerance, load balancing, easily add and remove uh, nodes. Uh, then like there's some non-technical reasons. Like there are a lot of other competing technologies to HBase, but we found that there's a large active community. There are lots of users of HBase today, and there are there were some online use cases which were larger in scale compared to ours, like messages at Facebook and so on. So we, we chose to go with this technology. So the, uh, now I'll talk about where, and I will try to, try to touch on a few applications of HBase and maybe try to answer why we felt that HBase was an appropriate store here. So, um, so there are some online applications which basically power some core features of our website, such as personalized feeds, uh, rich pins, and recommendations. And then there are some offline, um, offline uh, applications like matrix collection, search indexing, uh, Pinterest analytics, and so on. So I'll, for, this, uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll just touch on the online applications because I mean, we, there are already a lot of offline applications and I mean that use case is pretty well understood, but the online one is, is, is probably the more interesting. So firstly, uh, uh, personalized feeds. Uh, the way we do feeds on Pinterest is like we basically leverage the relationships amongst the various entities on Pinterest, like uh, who owns a particular board, is somebody following a board, and so on and so forth, to actually like basically make use of the graph on Pinterest, which connects all the entities to actually build personalized feeds. So one of the very simple uh, ways of doing that is by allowing this kind of follow relationship between users or like between users and boards to like create this notion of a following feed uh, for a user. Um, I mean, we call it the following feed. In the context of Facebook, it would be the news feed. For Twitter, it would be the timeline. And like maybe somebody calls it friend feed or something. So if you think about this problem, um, the way it's currently implemented at Pinterest, it's predominantly a push-based model. So essentially, whenever a, a user actually pins a new pin, that pin needs to be fanned out or written out to the following feeds of all the users who are following that particular user. Right, so we we, we basically pre-materialize all the feeds in some kind of um, uh, in some kind of storage. So because of this kind of push model, this application tends to be really really write heavy, um, and there's this kind of amplification as new pins come into the system and they get written out to all the 
all the feeds of people who, who follow that user. So I mean, the write-heavy nature basically makes HBase kind of an appropriate store for this kind of application. We get like lots of uh, writes on this per day, like uh, of the order of billions of writes every day. So yeah, just um, quickly touch upon the schema that we use for a lot of our feed systems. So essentially, the user ID is the key for um, is is the key is is the row key, and then all the, so we only store identifiers in our feed storage. The metadata is stored uh, stored on MySQL, um, and we have we basically uh, store the pin IDs as the columns, and then we kind of salt it with uh, with how we want to order the pins. So for example, in this particular case, we want to order the pins by when they were created. So the newest pin should be the first, and then the older ones. So we use like the reverse order creation timestamp uh, and kind of absorb it into the column so that HBase does the sorting for us. Uh, for this particular application, we chose a wide schema because we wanted kind of atomic transactions on a user's feed. Uh, HBase provides uh, single row atomic transactions. Uh, the, the pins just get reverse chronologically sorted like HBase gives you uh, gives that to you for free, and since rows do not get uh, fragmented across regions by HBase, uh, it also ensures that a single user's data is like confined to a single server. So we we found that there were, there are some uh, there's some very miscellaneous and interesting challenges for this particular application, uh, uh, particularly given the way uh, HBase actually handles deletion of data. Because HBase is a, is a log structured merge tree, it basically it adds data as you delete. So it deletes data by actually adding delete markers. So if you look at the application, since as more pins come in and the feeds keep getting longer and longer, we need a way of actually trimming the feeds so that like we don't keep, keep blowing up our data storage requirements exponentially. So we actually uh, kind of worked around this problem by, like we tried some, some some, uh, some approaches where we would just delete data by you know, running MapReduce jobs or something, but all that did was just add a whole bunch of delete markers, which only get cleared during major compactions, which is like really expensive. So we used a more advanced feature of HBase, which was coprocessors. And what we do is that since compactions are an integral part of HBase, we actually trim the user's feeds as part of compactions. So this was a pretty interesting way of how you could actually use coprocessors and do some advanced um, kind of operations. The other problem we ran was again had to deal with delete markers. Like there was some kind of spam, uh, there was these tail spammers who were like doing bulk follow on follow actions and their feeds were just growing really long with like hundreds of thousands of delete markers in them. And we would ha sometimes have these slow queries which would kind of kill, uh, kill our performance. So I'll not go into the details of that, but we came up with another coprocessor based approach to actually work around that, that as well. So yeah, I mean, write heavy application, so yeah, HBase was a good fit. Um, so yeah, I'll just talk a little about the feeds architecture. So the way it looks currently is that like we have the following feed, um, uh, which is stored in HBase, a related pins feed, which is also stored in HBase. Then there's a feed mixer, which kind of um, collates these feeds, builds them into one, and gets all the pin IDs which belong to a particular, uh, which, which are in the feed for a particular user, and then like gets the metadata from MySQL and memcache, and then renders the page. So the other application was rich pins. So a lot of pins on Pinterest are actually very high quality. For example, there are product pins, there are um, recipe pins, and we actually scrape them and, and kind of get some, uh, some of these uh, like metadata. Like in this case, we get uh, price, where the product is from, and what is the name of the product, and we display that to the user. So yeah, the basic idea is you crawl URLs and you scrape metadata. Uh, now, this is a very different workload. You have a high number of bash random reads. Why this is bash random reads is because we show these grid, like this grid of like 50, 100 pins to the user. And we need to know what is the rich pin metadata associated with each of those pins. But if you think about it, like there are only a, there are less than 10% of pins which are actually rich pins. So HBase comes with like intrinsic bloom filters. So that actually helped us a lot with like removing negative hits right away with, with, with a very cheap, um, like cheap, cheap additional, uh, with almost no additional cost. There's no need for any kind of negative caching or anything. So, I mean, it, it was also a, a good fit for this use case. And then also like a lot of this data, which is like keyed by a pin URL, happens to be like semi-structured. Like some pins you want price, name, for some of them you want like ingredients and quantities like for recipe pins. So like doing semi-structured data is typically easier with like column-oriented stores like Cassandra and HBase. 
So yeah, I mean, uh, this is another application we chose to go with edge, uh, go with edge space for. And then uh, recommendations. Um, so uh, a lot of our recommendations are just Hadoop jobs. Like we, we do have real time recommendations for certain parts of our system, but for the most part, we have a lot of Hadoop jobs which generate, you know, these um, uh, sequence files or like range sharded edge files, and. Um, the way we uh, use HBase there is by basically copying, doing a bulk copy of all these edge files directly into an HBase cluster, which can then serve the end users. So I mean, there are some issues like which is again just because of AWS that like the the version of HBase that we run is not the same as the Hadoop version uh, of AWS EMR where our Hadoop jobs run. So you need to uh, work around that by using some different interfaces for doing the copying. Uh, another thing we noticed that we run the disk CP on a different cluster than the one that's serving, because we found that the uh, this CPA job actually consumes a huge amount of resources, uh, like the the map reduce uh, mappers and the, the the task trackers involved in the map reduce. Um, so yeah, that's that's recommendations, um, and there are actually a lot of examples of these, like people who pinned this also pinned, which is like a pin to pin recommendation, and we have like all sorts of like user to board, board to pin, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I'll just talk into the uh, how part now, like what were the limitations and like what are the requirements of these applications is that like there's a lot of real time user traffic and like really critical traffic, critical side features, a uh, lot of random reads. Uh, availability is very important. I think availability was, was the most important thing when we um, started this off. And the second thing is performance, uh, that the P99, P90 latencies is critical, but what we found was that like when we were we were really rigorous about uh, the availability side, and what we found was that a lot of these things are actually uh, not driven by HBase alone, but in the way HBase actually interacts with the Hadoop file system, which is uh, which is the underlying layer. So okay, so for, uh, so I'll just focus on mean time to recovery. We what we want is that when when machines fail, we're able to quickly recover from machine failures. So this is uh, like these are like the high level stages of what happens when a region server goes down. So region server goes down, gets detected in 30 seconds. It has this write ahead log, which is the outstanding edits, which needs to be closed like by HDFS, and then uh, it needs to be read. It needs to be split to recover the edits for the different regions, and then the regions need to be recovered. Um, even though like we decreased all the zookeeper timeout, like our our uh, our criteria for detecting dead servers from the HBase side was pretty aggressive, which is 30 seconds. We still found that HDFS has a pretty poor mean time to recovery, and that basically spoils the whole process. And there are actually different stages at which that, that creates a problem. So we found just the recovery times from a real failure were typically like more than 10 minutes, and sometimes there was uh, kind of no recovery at all, and we had to actually do some kind of manual intervention. So uh, a lot of that, uh, so fortunately, around the time when we were experimenting with this, uh, the HDFS community uh, was, was also actively looking at this issue. And a lot of the reason why this is the case is that HDFS has only two states for nodes. One is a live node and, a and then a dead node. Um, and the, the time after which a, a node is marked dead is actually 10 minutes, which is kind of pretty conservative. So for 10 minutes, HDFS still thinks that a node that is not heart beating is actually alive. Uh, and the reason why this uh, uh, timeout is kind of conservative is that once a node is marked dead, you start, uh, it starts recopying of all the data that was lost, which is kind of another expensive operation. And so you really want to be very sure that a node is actually dead before we, you start recopying all the data that is on that node. So this is what the community did, and uh, we actually uh, incorporated all these patches that they introduced us uh, uh, an intermediate state in between, which is a stale node state. So the stale nodes basically avoid, uh, they're like they get avoided for reads and for writes, but the copying still waits until that node is like confirmed to be dead. So having this kind of stale node actually helps the MTTR story a lot. So we run with uh, all the stale node patches. So what happens is, okay, failure detection uh, happens at the HBase side. 
Least recovery starts from the HDFS side. So we contributed the HDF, uh, the, uh, uh, like one of these, the, the least recovery JIRA to, to make sure that like least recovery does not ever touch a stale node, which is a node which has not heart beaten for like 20 seconds. And then during the log split stage also, uh, like th this was again work by the community and we kind of pulled it into our uh, Hadoop branch, is that during the log split phase, the stale nodes are never contacted. The other replicas are actually chosen as candidates for reads and for writes. So we avoided stale nodes, and then we had some crazy timeouts, uh, which we had to um, really bring down, which was like uh, the Hadoop IPC connect timeout is like 20 seconds with 45 retries. So I mean, that just takes a few minutes out of your uh, recovery process right away. The other thing was just simulating. Like we can't really do a pull the plug failure because I mean, we run on AWS. But then we just ran different iterations of this you first kill the data node and the region server. So always kill both the data node and the region server because just killing the region server does not exercise the HDFS recovery code paths. So kill, kill both of them, leads to connection refused errors, see that the recovery is fine. Kill, suspend the processes. There are no connect timeouts, but there are socket timeouts. Make sure that those timeouts are fine. And finally, this was the most uh, uh, extreme one, is just black hole the host using IP tables and like, I'm sure you can find this, like you can Google this and there's a very simple script to do that. Um, it leads to connect timeouts and all sorts of weird exceptions. It's the, it's the most representative of um, what failures look like on, on AWS. So this is like kind of the three things that we tested and made sure that like we had a good MTTR story for recovering from single node failures. And then there were single uh, points of failure. HBase has none, but uh, HDFS has single points of failure. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any kind of like NFS. The typical uh, way of doing this is that a name node writes to NFS, which is mounted across two name nodes. The other name node is like a standby, but we don't have any like NFS filer or like any kind of uh, shared storage on EBS. So just what we have is like we can use e we use EBS for EBS and the ephemeral drives for the name node image for durability, and we have this uh, cold standby, which which does not have access to EBS at the same time, but like we can fail over uh, like in case uh, of an outage. And we use like elastic IP addresses uh, for building this kind of virtual IP address for the name node, um, name node so that like you can do a failover without actually having to reconfigure your data nodes. Uh, we didn't go for any of the fancier solutions, uh, just to keep it simple, this is already pretty complicated. And we operate two clusters for highly available solutions. Each runs in its own availability zone on AWS so that we can be, like, uh, if there's an availability zone outage, we can still keep serving. So at a high level, um, uh, reads and writes, uh, the way writes work is that, like, you have two clusters. They're either replicated through the HBase intrinsic replication that HBase provides, or in some cases, uh, we just, uh, we, we have our message queue systems. Like, in some cases, these are, like, just simple Kafka consumers. In, uh, in other cases, it's the Pyrus, which is our message queue system. We just write, do dual writes to both the clusters and make sure that the writes are kind of idempotent so they can be retried. The front end talks to one of these clusters based on uh, some kind of configuration, which is uh, we use Zookeeper for storing that so that you know, uh, just with the push of a button, we can quickly switch over clusters across our application, uh, across our entire application server fleet. So yeah, performance, I don't think we uh, did, did any of that rigorously, but we made some like small, low-hanging uh, stuff, which was like make sure that your block size is small on the cache. Uh, we, we use uh, prefix compression where it's apt, like where all the data is in, your, in, is in the key. Prefix compression, uh, because HBS stores everything as, uh, it, uh, everything is lexicographically sorted. Uh, HBase uh, uh, can do, uh, you can get pretty effective savings by doing um, prefix compression. So we, we found almost like 4x uh, reduction on certain data sets like the feeds cluster. Uh, then we also, uh, for, for cases where we have a lot of writes coming in, so we care about throughput for writes, but we care about latency for reads. We actually separated out the uh, RPC handler threads for reads and writes inside the HBase region server because we found that like reads were just getting starred off um, uh, RPC handler threads. So that was another optimization which really helped on tail latency. Uh, then like the, there are the standard like short circuiting local reads and like HBase level checksumming. These are kind of standard um, HBase optimizations. 
uh, just like optimize the way HBase interacts with HDFS. Uh, for hardware, we run both SATA and SSD clusters. Um, so that's the M1XL, C1XL. All are equipped with four drives. Uh, Yash already talked about it, 400 gig, 1.6 terabytes. The SSD is two one terabyte solid state drives. Uh, we choose uh, based on the limiting factor, what the limiting factor for a cluster is. Like if it's disk space, SATA is better because you get the maximum amount of disk per dollar. But if you really want IOPS, low latency, we pick SSD because you have uh, you get more IOPS per dollar. Uh, these are just clusters which have a lot of which are serving a lot of reads or which have just a lot of compaction activity going on because of a lot of writes. So in the pipeline, like this is just uh, some of the things that we are looking at. We want to do a little more failure testing, maybe the, uh, simulate some name node failures, which we have like done only once or twice. Uh, cross cluster client failover, like the client. Uh, in the cases where we really don't care about consistency that much, and we have two clusters, we ideally want that the client should be able to like detect timeouts happening for, from a particular cluster and be able to fail over to the secondary cluster without requiring manual intervention. So that would actually bump up our site availability even more. Uh, then, um, yeah, we, we, ha we don't have a, a great disaster recovery uh, story yet for HBase. We have been just relying on redundancy and like having, uh, operating multiple clusters. Um, Performance-wise, we have done some benchmarking on SSDs, but like not a whole lot of work there. Uh, then like multi-region uh, server reads, like basically batched RPCs, which do batch reads. So apparently that code path is not very optimal in uh, HBase, and like that's a requirement from a lot of our teams that they want to be able to run these RPCs really fast. Apparently like HBase is really slow even when the data is um, all cached in memory. So we are looking into that. And then like this one is kind of way out there, like having block locality and the HBase master drives uh, block, uh, block placement. The idea here is that basically HBase and HDFS operate totally independently. So it's quite possible that when rebalancing happens or like regions move around, you lose block locality, as in you have to go over the network to actually read the data. So I mean, there is, there's already been a lot of work done by Facebook on their branch to actually fix this issue. But like this is not, this is not really a problem for us right now, but I mean, this, this might be something that we, we have to look at eventually. So yeah, that's about it. Like, any questions? Uh, hey, yeah. um, great talk. Uh, have you explored the um, uh, usage of Dynamo DB, especially for a low latency uh, read type of situation versus HBase? Uh, uh, yeah, so we actually have not uh, explored Dynamo DB, like as far as I know. Um, and uh, I think the reason for that is also like we don't want to get vendor locked into Amazon, right? And uh, Dynamo, D uh, yeah, and like for example, recently uh, Amazon replaced their Apache Kafka uh, replacement, so we're probably not going to be switching from Kafka to their thing, right? And the other thing is, um, I think Dynamo DB like uh, it it um, uh, charges you per uh, like read transaction per write transaction. So I'm not sure like if that's actually the right kind of pricing model for us to be looking at, so, yeah. So h how big are these HBase clusters? Uh, so, um, yeah, we have actually made sure that uh, most, like, we make sure that there are not too many multi, too much multi-tenancy in the cluster, so they're like separate clusters for different applications. I think the SATA clusters, the largest one is uh, up to 50, uh, of the order of 50. And uh, there are like the SSD ones are small because the SSDs are actually very expensive. So then the tens to twenties. Yeah. And do they run in a VPC or no? No. 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 None of our stack is on VPC. So so when you are talking about uh, locality, you don't really care about rack locality or anything. You just care yeah. So we don't do rack locality. We don't do HDFS rack locality. We just run in the same AZ and just run like everything is on the same rack and the replica placement is kind of random across the HDFS cluster. Thanks. Thanks for uh, contributing some of the patches to HDFS. Yeah. Uh, I'm Suresh. Uh, okay. I've reviewed some of your patches. Yeah. Uh, what version of uh, HBase and uh, Hadoop are you using? Yeah, we're using 94.7 for uh, HBase. And for Hadoop, we are using CDH 4.2. Uh, so that's like Hadoop 2.0.
So I'm curious about the Zookeeper ensemble that you shown in the, shown in the diagram. Okay. Um, I, I, my question is simple. Uh, how many servers do you have in the Zookeeper ensemble, and uh, how are they? Uh, I, I mean, how are they across different geos? Yeah. So I think there uh, we had we have been uh, uh, increasing the strength of this cluster. Um, so I think the last time it was seven, the number of uh, the Zookeeper uh, servers in the ensemble and. We do use ob Zookeeper observers, which are these non-voting members to act, because a lot of this traffic is actually like reads, uh, like uh, basically the front-end servers establish a watch, a Zookeeper watch on a particular configuration, and then they get notified, right? So a lot of it is actually read traffic, so we actually use uh, Zookeeper um, like observers to actually kind of shield the main ensemble from uh, all the traffic. So I think that's like in the tens, uh, small tens is the number of servers we use for uh, the observers. And this is not against, um, against uh, this is not across uh, geographical regions, it is across, it is across different availability zones within uh, AWS region. Uh, I think three, we operate in three, so yeah, I may be a little wrong, but I think it's three, yeah. All right, that's it. Cool. Thanks, Varun. Thank you.